morning. It's good to welcome you here for this very uh, special service as we, uh, as we come together and worship the Lord as we do every Sunday, but uh, as we also have scheduled a time of baptism where we welcome uh, four of our children as they have joined uh, God's family of faith and, uh, and just dedicate ourselves to, uh, to helping disciple them as they start their journey. We're glad you're here, and we know that you're here for a reason. So we just ask you to focus on what that purpose is for you this morning, on the message that God has in store for you. Let's prepare our hearts to worship him. say how it makes me feel to know that the rest of the staff asked me to walk up on stage with a bag of candy. But I'm going to tell you what this is about because we've already had some of our own children try to consume this. We have these bags at the exits today. This was Connor's idea. It's a great idea. A way for you to invite some people maybe to come to church on Easter that otherwise might not be here uh, Easter Sunday morning. So as you leave, I just want to let you know, you can grab one of these bags. It's got an invitation for our Easter services. We would love it for you to go out and use this maybe as a tool to invite somebody to church. Um, also, I just want to mention that the flowers in the front are from the Jim Harris family from the funeral that they had. We wanted to mention that they donated these flowers and say thank you. Uh, today is an incredibly busy day. It started with a deacon's meeting, and we're going to end it with a trip to Top Golf with the youth this afternoon. And then migrant camp training starts at 5:30 for all of our high school students. Um, it's just a great day with four baptisms. So glad you're here to be with us today. We just want to say welcome if you're a visitor. We actually have a visitor's card in the back of our bulletin. It's got a QR code. You can just scan it. We'd love for you to fill that out so we'd have your contact information. There's also a meal reservation form on the other side of that same card. Uh, if you would, let's just bow and just go to the Lord in prayer. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your love for your patience with our mistakes for the promise that we have of heaven one day as we sing the words of that song it takes me back to when i was younger and just thinking about uh just the great history of faith that we have and in this church father those our members here father that have served you faithfully for so long lord we're thankful for that but we want to pray that as we move forward that we wouldn't stop in that service that father we would be about your work and about your business the rest of the days of our life father we ask you to give us the strength and the wisdom as we serve you we pray that in jesus name amen at this time uh mark enfinger is going to come and share with you about a class that he is going to be leading uh this evening Okay, so how many among you have a phone with you this morning? All right. I'm not shocked. How many of you who have a teenager or a middle school age kid or even elementary school kid or a grandchild who has a device? So a lot of you. Um, I'm teaching a class today about protecting your home from what could come in through your screens, through your kids' screens. Um, I could tell you from over 20 years of working with youth, the number of conversations that I've had with young men who are struggling with what they're looking at on devices is really high. 
it's extremely high. I have a story to tell. I want to share it with you. Um, I want to share with you how I protect myself, how I've given my wife the keys to the kingdom in my home so that I am protected. And it's my choice. I've chosen to do that. I want to implore you as men to take the same steps that I'm taking toward this because it's a problem that we've kind of shuffled under the table, but it is, it is an enormous problem. And guys, it's worth the fight. And so we call it Web Wars. My wife came up with the title for that. I want you to engage in the battle with me in fighting a war. But not only that, what about the email that you click on, you come in, and the next thing you know, they're asking for a password and they're stealing your account. Billions of dollars are stolen from you every day. I want to give you tools to be careful about that phone call that comes in as well. So a lot of you who may, may think, man, this tech stuff is way over my head. I want to implore you to come today. Let me show you some ways that it's not as daunting as you think, that you can take control of what's going on in your home. If you've got young family, you're thinking about getting them a phone or you've gotten them a phone, I want to give you the tools that you need just to be able to get started. It's not as hard as you think. You can do this, and it's a battle that's worth fighting, protecting your home, yourself, and your children. See you soon. <clears throat> Thank you, Mark. That's going to be definitely a worthwhile class tonight, so I encourage you to come be a part of that. Today is also the day of our in-gathering for our Annie Armstrong Easter offering. We receive this offering every year. 100% this, of this offering goes directly to support North American missionaries who are serving the Lord across North, and, uh, across North America. So I hope that you came prepared with your envelope and your gift today. And so uh, let me lead us in a brief prayer, and then I'll ask you to just come and, and leave your offerings here. Uh, just drop them in the offering plate here at the altar, okay? Father, thank you for the joy and the privilege of being a part of a church family that supports missions. We know that if we are to reach our world for Christ, we must go to places and to people that have not yet heard the good news or not yet had an ample opportunity to respond in faith. So we thank you for all of the missionaries that we have out there serving you, and we pray that you, would, that you would encourage us to support them in every way that we can with our prayers, with our offerings, and, and with our practical help. So uh, be with us now as we receive this offering. May it be to the honor and glory of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. In his name we pray, and God's people said, amen. So as the music plays, y'all come. As we begin with the song you heard the choir start with, when we all get to heaven.
that you are here with us. And Father, when you're here with us, Father, we can release all of our burdens. We can release all of our worries, all of our troubles. And Father, we can experience your true peace because of what Jesus Christ has done for us. Father, as we look at the world around us, we see all of the unrest. And Father, we know that the time is drawing nigh for your son, Jesus Christ, to come back. So we just ask you, Father, that you will help light a fire inside of us, an urgency to share Jesus. So that, Father, that, that, that what you desire for the whole world to know that gospel message can come true. And, Father, that we can be part of that blessing. Until then, Father, will you just continue to make us bold every day as we await the coming of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We ask these things in the name of Jesus Christ, who loved us even though we were unlovable. Amen.
Thank you, choir. Good to see you all here today. This morning we come to the 13th chapter of Romans, Romans 13. We're talking about anticipating our Lord's return. And our key verse is Romans 13, verse 11. Would you read it with me? And do this understanding the present time. The hour has already come for you to wake up from your slumber because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. Paul is writing to people much like us today. They're busy. They've involved, uh, they're involved in their uh, busy workaday lives. They're up to their necks and things to do. They're, they're hardworking people just trying to make a living. I mean, they're just trying to, to get by from day to day doing their best to survive, nose to the grindstone, a lot like us. They're just living from day to day. And the Apostle Paul is trying to wake up believers here from their spiritual slumber. He challenges them to understand the time. He's not talking about chronological time. He's talking about the time in which they live. Like us, they're living in the in-between time between the first coming of Christ and the second coming of Christ. He's saying that time is of the essence. You need to make the most of the time that you have now before Christ returns. The day is drawing near. We don't know exactly when it's going to be, but we need to live as if the time were now. We need to live with that sense of urgency in light of his second coming. It seems that in the first century, believers uh, responded to the anticipated return of Christ in one of two ways. Some underreacted and others overreacted. Some kept on working and living as they always had, and nothing really changed. They continued going about their business and doing the, the same old kind of routine. Other believers, however, overreacted to this anticipated return of Christ. They were looking for Jesus to return soon. And I'm talking very soon. If not today, then maybe tomorrow. If not tomorrow, then certainly by next week. I mean, they were really looking for Jesus to return at any moment. Now, if you're, if you're looking to him to return that quickly, then the ordinary concerns of life don't really mean that much anymore. Things like your job, for instance, obeying laws, paying taxes, you know, things like that. I mean, why bother with that if Jesus is about to return at any moment? So some of these believers quit their jobs, put on white robes and climbed up on rooftops and looked up to the skies ready for Christ to return at any moment. And so Paul is addressing both these groups here in chapter 13 of Romans, and he he gives them three very clear imperatives, three things that they must do as they anticipate the coming day of the Lord. These three imperatives are just as important, just as vital for us today as they were in the first century. Number one, Paul says, live by the law of the land. Live by the law of the land. Notice what he says beginning in verse 1 of Romans 13. Let everyone be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, whoever rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted. And those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers hold no terror for those who do what is right, but for those who do wrong. So do what is right, and you will be commended. For the one in authority is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for rulers are agents of wrath to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. Paul said, even with the day of the Lord drawing near, You still need to submit 
to the governing authorities. Why is that? Well, in that passage we just read, he gives us a couple of reasons because God has appointed them in the first place, right? So they're, they're servants acting on behalf of the Lord and because the authorities will punish those who don't obey. So it's best to go ahead and obey. Now, who are these governing authorities? Well, the term refers to any person who represents the power of the state from the local politician all the way up to the leader of the nation. God has instituted this plan for ruling the world and we are to submit or to stand under this hierarchy with the understanding that God himself has, has established every authority that exists. Now throughout scripture, God, God's providential rule over all things is, is specifically applied to the rise and fall of political leaders. Daniel proclaims to Nebuchadnezzar in the Old Testament, he said, the most high God is sovereign over all kingdoms of the earth. When we rebel against what they tell us to do, we're rebelling against the Lord himself. And so judgment will result from that. One of the purposes of secular government is to act as God's servant. So political officials are servants of God. That word for servant here is diakonos, same word that we get our word deacon from. It literally means those who stir up the dust, helping others. So our political leaders are to give themselves in service to the people. They serve God's purposes in the world. They've been given the responsibility by God to punish wrongdoers and to help those who do what is good. As citizens, we are to be thankful for our political leaders. We're to pray for them, that God would direct them in their responsibilities. We are to respect them and be subject to them. As we've said before, if you can't respect the person, at least respect the office in which they hold. So does that mean that we're to always obey these people? Well, it's interesting here that Paul does not use that word obey. He speaks of submission or being subject to, which is to recognize uh, your subordinate place under someone. It's to acknowledge that certain institutions or people have been placed over us and they deserve our respect. But of course, our ultimate submission is always to God. And, and no other human being can ever stand as the ultimate authority for us as believers. As God's people are to strive to, to be good citizens, we are to obey the law of the land unless and until those laws contradict the laws of God. The classic example of this in the New Testament is Peter and John when the Sanhedrin commanded them to not speak about Jesus, they responded in Acts 4, judge for yourselves whether it's right in God's sight to obey you rather than God. For we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. It's getting increasingly difficult to give our political leaders, especially some of those on the national level, the respect that we owe them. I, I understand that. I get that. Uh, it's not easy sometimes, but what should be our response as followers of Christ? Well, you see the, the four bullet points there. We need to be prayerful, for one thing. We need to pray for them. Whether you agree with them or not, whether you agree with their policies or not, pray for them, pray for God's direction, and then be respectful of them. Again, if you can't respect them as, as individuals, at least respect the office in which they hold, and then be informed. Be informed on the issues. Uh, read and, 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 and understand the, the major issues of the day and what's going on, and then be involved. Be involved in the process. Certainly be involved in the voting process. Be prayerful, be respectful, be informed, and be involved. As I understand the times and prepare for the coming day of the Lord, I need to live, Paul says, by the law of the land. Number two, as we anticipate his return, we need to live in the love of God. Now, we talked about this last week, son. But notice what Paul says again here in Romans 13, beginning in verse 8. <clears throat> Let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another. 
For whoever loves others has fulfilled the law. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not mur murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and whatever other command there may be are summed up in this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. So in verse 8, Paul returns to this theme of love. In the latter part of chapter 12, he talked about ways in which a believer should demonstrate sincere love. He now reminds us that, that all the commandments of the Old Testament law culminate in this one demand that we love our neighbors as ourselves. Paul tells us as a habit, we're not to be in debt to anyone, but there is, no, but there is one debt that will never be completely repaid. And that's the debt that we owe to others, the debt of love. The moment we come into this world, we owe a debt of gratitude and love to others. Think about it. Where would you be today without the love and nurture of those around you, family, friends, others who have taken care of you and guided you along life's journey? Think about all the people who've been there for you through the years. Parents, grandparents, siblings, cousins, extended family, friends, teachers, Coaches, co-workers, church members. I mean, the list is endless. We could go on and on. The fact is, God uses people to bless your life. He uses people. Sometimes he blesses us directly, but most of the time, he uses others to bless us. He could do it without people, but he chooses to use others to guide and comfort you and strengthen you and point you in the right direction and advise you and encourage you and lift you up and show you the way and remind you that you are loved. Jesus said, freely you have received, freely give. Just as others have given to you along the way, you're to give back to them in return. And what we learn is that the more we give to others, the more we receive in return. It always comes back to you, doesn't it? I mean, you can't love others without receiving some measure of love in return. As you show love to others, you, you get it back. Love is a dynamic thing, and it continues to grow and to multiply. But there's something else we need to, to, we need to remember about love. Jesus taught us that our love should not be confined only to those who love us or like us. Or to those who can do something for us. When we love only those who love us or those who can help us out, then it becomes a selfish thing, doesn't it? And love, true love, is unselfish. Biblical love is a selfless thing. It's doing what's best for the other person. And giving yourself away. And offering to those in need. God so loved the world that he did what? He gave us his most precious thing, his son. Therefore, biblical love means, and the two bullet points there, loving those who are different from us. How are you doing on that measure? It's easy to love those who are like us, right? It's easier to love people who have the same values that we have. Same habits, same behavior. But what about those who are different? We're to love them. And it's loving those who are different and then loving those who cannot do anything for us in return. Uh, when's the last time you showed love to somebody who could not do anything for you in return? Think about the people in your life. Think about the people that you love and care about. Do any of them fit in these two categories. If not, consider this a wake-up call. God wants you to get outside of yourself and give yourself to those who are different from you and those who can't do anything for you. When we love God with all of our heart, mind, and strength, and we love others as ourselves, we don't have to worry about all of the other various commandments in the Bible. I mean, it's hard to keep up with all the commandments, right? 
But if you just love in the way he taught us to love, if we love as Jesus loved, then we're going to take care of most of those commandments, right? That's what, what Paul is saying. So genuine love is the fulfillment of all the commands of Scripture. And that just simplifies life, doesn't it? As I understand the time and prepare for the coming day of the Lord, I need to live by the law of the land. And I need to, to live in his love. And then thirdly, Paul said, I need to live with a sense of urgency. Live with a sense of urgency. Look at Romans 13, beginning in verse 12. And do this. Understanding the present time, the hour has already come for you to wake up from your slumber. The, <clears throat> the night is nearly over. The day is almost here. So let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us behave decently as in the daytime, not in carousing and drunkenness, and not in sexual immorality and debauchery, not in dissension and jealousy. Rather, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the flesh. Paul tells us that understanding the present time should govern our conduct we need to recognize both what God is doing and what he plans to do and then live accordingly why because understanding the time leads to right living it leads us to a sense of urgency in our lives understanding the time provides three things one it provides motivation motivation when we understand the present time and we know that Christ is coming soon, we will be highly motivated because we know the time is short. Our salvation is drawing near the final accomplishment of God's plan in history. The day of Christ's return and the glorification of every believer is drawing near. That should motivate you to live holy lives. It should motivate you to share the love of God with those around you. This imagery of night and day was a common teaching tool in the ancient world. The night is the time when people indulge in their sinful desires often. The day referred to the day of the Lord when God would intervene and judge the world and usher in the eternal age. We are reminded that we live in the night. We live in darkness and the evidence of the darkness of this world is all around us. The brokenness of a world that no longer looks to God for help. The darkness is real and it is evident. Just look around you. It's dark. It's dark out there. We live in desperate times and when you understand the present time, you'll be motivated to awake from your slumber, as Paul says, to, to be renewed in your mind and to accomplish the will of God in your life. You will live with a uh, a greater sense of urgency. I feel a greater sense of urgency than ever before in my life. I truly feel like our time is getting short. You know, the National Football League, they have what's called a two-minute warning. And it's just to remind teams, okay, you've only got two minutes left in this first half, or you only got two minutes left in the game. So whatever you're going to do, you better do it now. You got any special plays out there? You need to run them now. If you need a greater sense of urgency, you better get it right now because this game is almost over. And I kind of feel, I just kind of sense like the Lord has given us the two-minute warning that whatever we're going to do for Him, you better do it now. Whatever you're going to accomplish for His purpose, you better do it. Don't put it off and don't delay because the time is short. As a people of God, we need to understand the time. The better we do that, the greater our sense of urgency will become. Understanding the time also provides not only motivation, but also direction. It, it gives us a sense of direction. When you understand that the time is short, you have a, a greater sense of direction. You want to put aside the deeds of, of darkness and put on the armor of light. It, it's like changing clothes. You take off one suit and you put on another. You know, sometimes just changing your apparel can change your attitude. You put on a new suit and you feel 
a little better about yourself. You have maybe a little more confidence, a new outlook on life. That's what Paul is saying here. You need to put on the armor of life. We're, we're, why armor? Because we are to carry on spiritual warfare for our Lord. We are surrounded by the forces of darkness. We're taking fire from the prince of darkness. Therefore, it is absolutely imperative that we suit up with the armor of light and fight the good fight of faith. At the end of his life and ministry, Paul proudly proclaimed, I have fought the good fight. When you're surrounded by the enemy, you have one of two choices. You can either fight or you can fall. You're going to do one or the other. You can fight or you can fall. And we have far too many of God's people who are falling by the wayside, left and right. They're just falling down. They're stumbling. They're falling. The evil one has won a victory over their lives. At the end of his life in ministry, Paul said, hey, I have, I've done everything I could do. I have fought the good fight. So if you're not fighting the good fight of faith, then you've fallen down in the midst of the battle. And, and you're, you're of no use to your commander-in-chief, the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at it this way. If you're not fighting the darkness, if you're not feeling the heat of the battle, then you're not experiencing the fiery darts of the evil one. If you're not struggling against the forces of darkness, it can mean only one thing. You have fallen in the midst of the battle. And if the evil one is not attacking you, it's because you pose no threat to him. He's already won you over. So if you're having a tough time, and it's tough sledding, and you're thinking, Lord, I belong to you. I've invited you into my life, and look at I'm just having one trial after another, one challenge after another. Well, good news, that means you're doing something for God's kingdom because the evil one is fighting back against you. I hope I can look back one day and say with the Apostle Paul, I have fought the good fight. Understanding the time also provides one other thing, and that's focus. Focus. Maintaining focus means you refuse to get distracted by less important things. I believe our God is heartbroken when he sees our lives filled with things, stuff that really do not matter. I, I fear that some of us will stand before the Lord on the day of judgment, and he will examine our lives and say, well, you stayed out of trouble. You didn't do any." Horrible, terrible things. You were polite and friendly to others. You made a good living. You supported your family. You, you lived a pleasant life. You took vacations and you went to ball games and you lived, an, you lived in a nice home and you didn't rob or cheat or steal from anybody. But what did you accomplish for my kingdom? Who is in heaven because of you? Whom? Did you really serve in your life? Paul says we are to behave decently or carefully. There's an old English phrase that's not used much anymore, but it kind of captures the thought here. Walk circumspectly. Walk circumspe circumspectly. Circum means a circle, right? Spec means spectacles, looking. So it means looking around. Look around. Look around at the opportunities for service the Lord is putting before you. Be alert. Look around at what God is doing and, and, and look around for not only the opportunities, but, but look around for the dangers as well. Those are the two things that we need to be aware of. What are my opportunities and what are my dangers? Opportunities to serve, dangers to avoid. Every day of your life, you ought to be looking for those two things. How can I serve and how can I avoid the dangers and the pitfalls of the evil one? Paul especially warns us about the danger of sexual sins, drunkenness and dissension. These sins are essentially the result of short-sightedness 
you're not taking the long view. It's here and now thinking. Those who fall prey to these sins can't see past the end of their nose. They're, they're not thinking long term. When you take the long view, when you think in terms of eternity, it makes you much more careful about your choices today. And finally, Paul said, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ. We who are in Christ must envelop ourselves with him in, in such a way that he directs our thinking and our conduct. And because we are in a continuing battle against darkness, we must continually make the decision to put on Christ. It's a decision that I make day by day and moment by moment, putting on Christ. My grandson, a few years ago, when he was a little younger, he really got into superheroes. I mean, he loved his superheroes. He loved Superman and Batman, Spider-Man, and Captain America. Those were his superheroes. And, of course, he had all the outfits for those superheroes to prove his love for them. I mean, I remember he had, you know, his little Superman costume with a Velcro little attached cape on the back. And he'd go running through the house with his cape flowing behind him. Or he would <clears throat> jump down from the couch and made a, a loud boom in the floor. If you weren't expecting it, it would scare you to death. But he loved his super heroes and um, you know the only problem with his fascination for superheroes is that he wanted to wear a superhero outfit every single day every day it was batman or superman or captain america it was it was one of them and in his mind, it was absolutely essential that he wear that superhero outfit every day, wherever he went. Isn't that what our Lord is asking us to do here? We are to clothe ourselves with the real superhero, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. And we are to do it with a sense of passion and urgency understanding the times in which we live. We are to be so immersed in Christ that it shows that it becomes evident when others see you, the first thing they see is what you're wearing. <clears throat> you come to church and somebody says, oh, nice dress, or I really like that shirt. It's a beautiful sweater. People notice what you're wearing, and that's the whole idea here, isn't it? When we're wearing Christ, people will take notice of that. We are to wear him every single day and never put him aside. So if Christ, if he's in the back closet of your life, you need to bring him out and wear him proudly every day of your life. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you that you are a God of all grace and love. And your love is unconditional, and it's not based on anything that we can do to deserve it. We thank you for the hope that we have in Christ, that one day the skies are going to unfold and our Lord is going to return in all of his mighty power and all of his glory and all victory to receive us unto himself and to take us home to the place that he has prepared for us from the foundation of the world. So, Father, we ask you this morning as your people, help us to understand the time in which we live. Help us to be aware of the need for a sense of urgency to live our lives out loud before others to put on Christ every single day so that when others see us, they see you. Lord, help us to live by the law of the land and even more importantly, to live 
through the love of our Lord. Show us the way. We pray if someone needs to receive you as Lord and Savior this morning, that this will be the time. We pray for those who are carrying a heavy burden that this will be the day they come and unload it on you. And if you're calling someone to come and be a part of our church family, we pray that this will be that time that they will come. Have your way in our hearts and in our lives. In Christ's holy name we ask it. Amen. We're going to stand and sing a hymn of invitation. I'll be waiting down front to receive you, to pray with you, whatever your need may be. You come as God speaks. soul, are you weary and troubled? No light in the darkness you see. There's light for a look at the Savior, and life more come now to worship our Lord through the giving of our tithes and offerings, and uh, our missionaries are Simon and Papia Sim, who are serving the Lord as North American missionaries up in Massachusetts, starting a new church up there. Let's pray for them, and along with all of our other North American missionaries, and if you didn't get a chance to give to the Annie Armstrong offering earlier, you certainly may do so at this time. John Hall is going to come as we prepare for our baptism and lead us in our prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day, and Father, we thank you for this message that Brother Mike brought this morning, uh, that we should be anticipating your return, Father. Help us to live that away each day, to be alert, and Father, we thank you for these four young people that have come forward and given their life to and accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior, Father, just to follow them the rest of their days, and uh, guide us in all we do. Father, bless these ties to the furtherance of your kingdom, for us now and always. Christ's name I pray. Amen.
Harper, confess Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. <clears throat> then in obedience to the command of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and upon your confession of faith in him, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Harper, Jesus tells us that you are now the salt of the earth and you are the light of the world. And as the Father has sent me, so I send you. And God's people said, Amen. Amen. Jackson, do you confess Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior? Yes. Then in obedience to the command of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and upon your confession of faith in him, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Harper, Jesus said that you are now the salt of the earth, Jackson, thank you. Jackson, you are now the light of the world, and as the Father sent me, so send I you. Adelaide, do you confess Christ as your personal Lord and Savior? Then in obedience to the command of our Lord and Savior and upon your confession of faith in him, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Adelaide, you are now the salt of the earth. And Jesus said, you are the light of the world. And as the Father sent me, so I send you. Claire, do you confess Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior? Yes. Then in obedience to the command of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and upon your confession of faith in him, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Claire, Jesus said you're now the salt of the earth and the light of the world. And as the Father has sent me, so I send you. And God's people said, Amen. Amen. Isn't this a beautiful sight? And we need to do this as, as often as we can. Connor, I think, has a closing word for us as we uh, close out our service this morning. And uh, so let's listen to him for just a moment. It's just an awesome day, wasn't it? Amen. Amen. Uh, just real quick, just wanted to remind y'all about the goodie bags that we've made. And I, Andy gave me credit for that. I cannot take credit for that. That was my wife's idea, so we've got to give her credit for that. <laughs> <laughs> but y'all come by. We're going to have a table right out here in the foyer. And we've got one over here by these glass doors. Y'all come, grab as many as you want, and just invite as many people to come next Sunday as you want to. Uh, Mark and Dinger's going to come and lead us in our closing prayer. When Summer signed me up to pray at the end, I was like, didn't you know I already had to get up and talk? <laughs> and as I was sitting there and I was listening to Brother Mike talk, um, I started to feel this overwhelming burden about what I've got to talk about tonight. And I realized that, you know, a lot of times you get up, you say something, you don't say everything that you wish you say in the home. Maybe God had a plan. If you are parents of a young you got young people in your home or grandparents that have young people in your home frequently and they're on devices tonight. 
you may learn one or two things from somebody who is not the most entertaining teacher or not the best teacher, or not, not the best prepared for tonight, but you may learn one or two things. It might be the most important one or two things you learn all year. I'm going to step out on limb. If you're in this room and you have a struggle that's related to that screen, tonight may put you on a journey of the most liberating, most freeing experience in Jesus Christ to set you free. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for today. You've called us, Lord, to serve you. You've called us to stand in the gap and to be fight and to be warriors and champions of the faith. And Lord, I pray that all these young people that went into those baptismal waters, that they will learn from those around us in this room that we are champions and we are fighters and we will stand in the gap for you, Lord. Lord, if it means praying with others, sharing our faith, whatever it means, Lord, and, and fighting things in our life that we need to fight, God, I pray that you will set us on the path of that today because you've called us for a greater purpose than we know, and we want to experience it fully. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.